So I want you to imagine yourself in your grave and the angels, they approach you. They ask you the three all important questions to see if you pass the test of life. Who is your Lord? What is your religion? And who is your prophet? Imagine you're in that state right now. Will you be able to answer those questions? You need to live by these answers so you can answer them in your grave. But a person can't live by something that he or she does not know. So you have to learn these things. For that reason, we have a Islamic studies program and we'd like to invite you to take a look at the program by joining our Telegram group at the link below. And if you like it, inshallah ta'ala, and you think this is something that could be suitable for you and you may be able to learn that your deen here, then you can register for the first year of our program. And hopefully, we see you on the other side. Salam alaikum. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam. Ala khatim al anbiya ashraf al mursaleen. Wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in amma ba'd. First thing, uh, I want to thank all of you for coming out. Allahi, uh, just been here a couple of days in the UK, but uh, the love I have seen from the brothers and the ikhlas and the uh, yani people ready to come and wait for hours and sit in tight places. Uh, it's really touched my heart. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this gathering mukhlisan lillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala solely for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make us from those as mentioned in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that come together and sit for the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dhikr here doesn't mean like ha hu and things like that. <laughs> dhikr here remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we sit and talk about the Quran or about hadith or about fiqh or about uloom. This is remembering of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for those people, malaika come. There are angels, as mentioned in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that look for these gatherings. And they sit one on each other. Like our saf, their lines, theirs are on top. And these people, when the people that gather, they gather for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these malaika, they go take this news to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though Allah knows better. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked them, why did they gather? I mean, this is something... If we think about it, something amazing because Allah knows better, but He's showing the malaika. Look, I created this makhluk. You thought they would make fasad on up, they, they would make mischief in the land, but they will be from them those that do righteousness. And there, when the malaika tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they gather for your dhikr, he asked them, What are they afraid of? What are they seeking refuge from? He said, From the nar. He said, Bear witness that I have saved them from it. What are they looking for? They're looking for the Jannah. They're seeking the, the pleasure of paradise. He said, bear witness, I've written it for them. Imagine us sitting just for something like this and what a reward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when they get up, the caller should call out the malaika, they call out even if we don't hear it, we believe in it. They stand up and your sins have been forgiven and turned into good deeds. All these beautiful fadail. Then one of the malaika, they said, there is somebody that came in that gathering without the intention to sit there. And he, al bin niyat. Everything requires, every ibadah, it requires intention. And everything will be rewarded by the intention. So somebody came to sit in that gathering just because they have some business. So they have something to deal with the brother there, not with the intention to sit. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the malaika, forgive that person as well. Even though he didn't come with the niyyah, why? Because of the suhbah, the, the good company that they kept. The ulama of Islam, they mentioned this is one of the only amal where even without intention, Allah will forgive you, Allah will reward you for it. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those that yani, are given these glad tidings and sit here for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The topic today is about uh, my experience and my... Um, benefits that I saw from seeking knowledge in Pakistan. When I was younger, uh, in America, we had a mindset. And the mindset was that knowledge only comes from Saudi Arabia. Uh, because great ulema that we love and we respect and we consider to be yani, from the top of the ulema of our generation, were from there. We used to read the books and hear the audios and the stories and about the great ulema like Shaykhuna Abdul Aziz ibn Abbas rahmatullahi Shaykhuna Muhammad Saleh ibn Uthaymin rahmatullahi and other a'imma and ulema like Shaykh Saleh al-Fawzan hafadahu Allah and other a'imma and ulema like Shaykh ibn Jibreen rahmatullahi These ulema, when we read their works, we were impressed by it. Then when we heard about ulema like Shaykhuna Nasruddin al-Albani, May Allah have mercy on him, rahmatullahi even though he's not from Saudi Arabia, but يعني, you would see 
the benefit from the uh, these land of the Arab and the benefit from them. So personally, I was not very interested in Pakistan. I thought the ulama of Pakistan are all mubtadi' and they are yani, all walazwalin uh, kind of guys. And <laughs> <laughs> so one time I was in Saudi and I was taking a flight to Peshawar. And uh, yani I was in Saudi I met with some ulama. I was, I was young. I, I was really interested in knowledge and things. So I was going to visit some family. And I happened to sit next to one Saudi. He was a Saudi. Yeah, mashallah with the beard and things. He was working with some any government uh, charity organization, something. And he told me, where are you from? I told him, Peshawar. He told me, you know Sheikh Amin? I told him, I never heard of him. He told him, you're from Peshawar? You never heard of Sheikh Amin? I, I never heard of him. Who's he? He said, he's a Sheikh. You should go see him. Hey, he's Pakistani. Some Desi guy, man. Forget it, right? <laughs> Either Brilli or Deobandi, man, they're both bad options. And one is worse, but they're both bad. So, khair, I was going. But subhanallah, uh, as Qadr would have it, when I got to Peshawar, I went to a village, my village. Somebody told me there is a sheikh here, he's teaching Bukhari, and he's really good, and his name is Sheikh Aminullah. That man, it's crazy, because I, I heard some guy on the plane telling me the same name. Yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it. Otherwise, if somebody hadn't told me, I would have been like, yeah, I'm, I'm good. But now that it happened twice, I said, Khalas, yani, let's go see who it's like. And subhanAllah, I went to an area called Ganj. I don't know if you've been to Peshawar. It's a pretty packed, dirty, <laughs> hood looking, I don't know what you guys call hood out here, man, but, right? A place. And you went into this madrasa and it was packed, like packed, like more packed than this. Yes, yes, it's possible. And Dars was amazing. Yani, I, I had just sat in halaqat and the haram and things, but when I sat and heard about the tarajim al abwab and how the fiqh is derived from the, from the abwab of Bukhari and the rawat and each rawi and talking about well, whether there was kalam or not and why not and why it wasn't. I was like, whoo, this is Pakistan? Wow. <laughs> so I started to, alhamdulillah, want to benefit from the ulama. And at the time, I had cassettes. Yes, yes, I'm old. So... I had a cassette of one of the shiukh, Sheikh Abdul Salam Rustami, he's from Mardan, Rahmatullah Ali. And I bought this the tafsir of Surah Yusuf, just two cassette tapes. And I loved Surah Yusuf, it's one of my favorite surahs in the Quran. I named my son Yusuf. Uh, and my niya when I named my son was to name my children after Anbiya in the Quran that have a surah and then memorize that surah, Shukran Lillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I had Yusuf, memorize Surah Yusuf. I had another son, I wanted to name him Yunus. And then memorize Surah Yunus, but my father told me name him Musa. And I was like, man, I gotta memorize the whole Quran now. <laughs> <laughs> so I was listening to Surah Yusuf and the tafsir was amazing. And the Shaykh was mashallah talking about yani, every word, and what's the sarf of it, and what's the fiqh of it, and ahadith. And in my mind, I started, because I was listening to an audio, it wasn't a YouTube, it wasn't a video. I started to visualize how it must be. And I visualized a man with like a big thing of notes, like how I do. I have notes and stickies and highlights and al-hashiyah that I've written out, notes from other books and things. And then to organize my mind, when I go to the next page, I look at what's there with notes that I have collected over all this time. Because he would mention like a nar and then he would say, these are other names for Jahannam in the Quran. In this surah, it's come with this name in this surah. So it had to have been really good notes. And then he would say, what are the difference between the names? And what is the rabat bain al-ayat? What is the relationship between the ayat? And why this name has come this way in this surah? And this name in this surah? And, and, and oh, mashallah, like amazing. So when I went, next time I told him, I want to go see this man. So I told some people, you know who he is? They said, yes, we know. We went to his dars. And subhanallah, when I saw him, I saw nothing but a mushaf in front of him. No notes, no stickies, no hash, nothing. All from memory. And I realized these are the people that have made khidmah of the Quran. These are people that taught tafsir for 30 years straight. Every year going through the whole Quran. These are people, not just him, I mean other ulama that would teach the Quran in such a way that they would be, they had memorized the ahadith, they had memorized the asanid, they had memorized the, the usul that they would be teaching in fiqh uh, from the Quran. And from the ayah, they would derive and explain, like, subhanallah. 
And we saw from those ulama a great, a great lesson. This was all from the academics of it. But I would say what I learned the most was the akhlaq, the mannerisms, and the adab, the manners, and the zuhud, the, the, the love for the akhirah and the detachment for the dunya from the ulama. When I went to their houses, when I saw how they lived, when I saw, yani, I wasn't used to it. I was used to, yani, you visit a sheikh and mashallah, he looks good and black car shows up and he sits with drivers and guards and mansions and gahwa and sitting and may Allah reward them. I mean, I'm not saying anything wrong with that. May Allah increase it for them, right? But when you see a sheikh who gives a dars of Bukhari, the like of Sheikh Ghulamullah Rahmati, which yani, would blow your mind, and then he gets on a bicycle. <laughs> Ay, mashallah. No guards, no fanfare, nothing. And his son, uh, Abdul Hamid Rahmati, uh, Rahmatullah Alayhi, was recently killed for being on the Sunnah by the people of Bid'ah. Subhanallah, yani, they killed his brother, or they shot his brother. So he was going to visit his brother on a bicycle. And then they shot him. And his other brother and the other people are still giving that one. They didn't go like, Khalas, man, we got shot at, it's over. No. These are people of yani, shuja, they're brave. People of zuhud. People who take that knowledge, not for money. They're not supported by any governments. They're not given a check. They're not paid. Uh, yani, they are people who stand on the haq, on the Quran, and the sunnah, and the way of the salaf al-ummah, and the aqeed al-sahihah and on the athar and they stand on it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they give their lives for it literally like not exaggerating you and I went to areas where the people of Bid'ah used to be very strong and shuyukh like Shaykh Abdul Salam when he went in Bunir there were shootouts like you guys you guys here be like oh this guy got a knife like oh that's good so does my daughter <laughs> We're not talking about people with, what is that, what are you guys, where is, where is Imran at, man? What is that, machete, whatever, the zombie, zombie machetes? We're talking about AK-47s and M4s and, you know, we're talking about, you go give a dars and you see 30 guys with, you know, magazines coming up, trying to, you know, shoot up the whole masjid. And you still go and give dars. You still go and speak the Quran and you still stick to what is Sahih and you still say Ameen out loud and you still make your and, he, and you stand and people and he, this what I saw was amazing. What I saw were the people and ulama that would be making their nawafil continuously. You would see them and I used to travel with some of the shoe and you would get in the car once me and Shaykh Amin Allah were going somewhere far and subhanallah, we were speaking with masail and fiqh and things and when that conversation ended, he didn't discuss anything else, started making nafil. Face toward the qibla, Allahu Akbar started making salah. For hours, we were driving, he's making salah, nafil, nafil. Akhi, we're in safar, it's okay. <laughs> and he, and he, La. I mean, this is the sunnah. And he had his own Quran that he always carries and reads from it. And he, we went to a madrasa out in the mountains, area where there's no electricity. And, he, and diarrhea was part of the game. And he, it came with a package. <laughs> and you go out to these areas where there's, there's not even like a good road. The road is about half of what your bicycle roads would be. Like, what, you know, the motorcycle road. I don't know if you guys have the little side thing from what it's about that big. And you have two-way traffic on it. I mean, this is death. And, he, and, 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 and the drivers, subhanAllah, they have tawakkul. <laughs> They'll be talking to you, turning behind, and while walking, while driving straight, and the car is coming, and he's on the edge, and you're like, Akhi, just drive, man, please. You know? They're like, no, no, you know what? <laughs> and you get to this madrasa, and, and it's far in the mountains, and then you meet tullab that have memorized mutun, that have memorized books, that, are, that have spent their life dedicated to knowledge. I met one uh, Talib Ilm, I mean, I would call him a Sheikh. And he had no hands. When he was a little kid, uh, you know, at the time when there was wars and things in Afghanistan, 
there was, uh, the Russians had put a lot of explosives. The Russians were very cruel people. They would put mines and explosives for kids to blow up on. And he, so he was going and he was playing with something and it turned out there was explosive, it blew up, it cut up, blew up his hands. So now imagine he has no hands. How does he hold a book? How does he hold a pen? But this sheikh had memorized the Quran, he had memorized Mutun, he had memorized Zad al Mustakni. Like we're in a village in the north of Bishar. How, how does he even know what Zad al Mustakni is? You know? And he had memorized it and he would read. I was like, wow, shocked. And Zad is not a, it's not a, a manduma, like it's not a poem. It's not like Bekunia or memorized Bekunia. Woo, four pages, wow. Right? But these were, man, mashallah. And, but what was impressive more than that is when we came, he got up he, with his yani, uh, cut off arms. He just had like a, like a stub, you know. But he could kind of grab a little bit, do two things. He went and made tea for us. He was carrying a cup. I felt, wallah, I felt ashamed. Older than us. More knowledgeable than us. Yani, but no kibr. Tawadu. Humbleness. I spent the night there. And I would hear the crying of the students. You know? Sometimes, I'm not going to mention names, but you go to certain universities and you see the students just wasting time. You see, na'udhu billah, sometimes students lighting up a cigarette. How are you going to study sharia? You're out there smoking cigarettes, right? You see students yani, talking about useless things. But here you saw students in the night crying, reading Quran. You would hear the recitation and their voice crack. And I was trying to sleep. <laughs> I was like, come on, man, you guys are ruining this, right? <laughs> but this is, this is when you see the true people of knowledge. Sometimes you tell somebody, I'm not a sheikh. Yeah, like, you know, some, like sometimes you see the videos, they're like, you're a scholar. I'm like, I'm not a scholar. And they think, oh yeah, he's being humble. No, no, I'm not. I'm just telling you facts. You know? <laughs> because I've seen shuyukh. And I've seen ulema. And I'm just not it. It's just reality. The key ingredient. What's the key ingredient of an alim? Huh? Ikhlas, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ عُلَمَاء خَشْيَةَ فَى اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى If you want to know somebody is a alim, don't just ask what degrees do you have, what did you memorize, who did you sit with. Some people, subhanallah, they'll go to a dars, they'll sit in it for five, six minutes, and khalas, they've become ulama. <laughs> One time, Shaykh ibn Uthaymeen was giving a dars, and he mentioned Qala Ahmed. And Imam Ahmed said. And one person in the dars, he, with the lack of etiquette, he said, Ya Shaykh, if he said Ahmed, he is a man and I am a man. Like, if Ahmed said, he is a man and I am a man. Like, what does it matter? So Shaykh ibn Athameen told him, Hafadha Ahmed, Alf Alf Hadith. That Imam Ahmed memorized one million hadith. Alf, Alf. You know the Arab? They didn't have a number for million. They couldn't count that high. <laughs> now I'm, I'm serious. It's not an insult. Yeah? The Arab, in the early times, they didn't... Million today, like we say million, it's English, right? They didn't have a word for million. So they said thousand, thousand. I mean, three zeros and three zeros. So Shaykh Ibn Taymin said, Hafadha, Ahmad, Imam Ahmad, he memorized a million hadith. Kam hafad taqhi? How many did you memorize? Now go ahead. <laughs> this is the lack of etiquette. Today you see people stretching their feet towards their teacher. And then you tell them, Akhi, yani, this is Khalif al Adab. And tell you, brother, where's the hadith on this? You tell them, you know, Imam al Shafi'i, he said, I wouldn't stretch my feet towards the house of my Shaykh. In the direction of the house of my Shaykh. If you're Salafi, then that's the Salaf. <laughs> Then follow their way. Abu Yusuf, the student of Abu Hanifa, he used to say, 40 years, 40 years I never left making dua for my Shaykh. Every day making dua for my Shaykh. And this was the way, the methodology of the Salaf of this Ummah. And I found many aspects of that in, some, in Pakistan. I saw, alhamdulillah, many ulama, 
Some of them, like Sheikh uh, Abdul Rahman, uh, he is in Islamabad, and this is uh, Sheikh Abdul Rahman. Uh, I went to uh, one of my shiuch in Amarat. I studied with the Sheikh Nim Sadiq. He told me you should study Al Fiya ibn Malik. Al Fiya ibn Malik is very, mashallah, beautiful book. And he said, I don't know if anybody more qualified to teach it than a man in Pakistan. I was like, Sheikh, you're from Sudan. <laughs> you studied in Saudi all your life. How do you even know anybody in Pakistan? <laughs> He told me, no, go to this sheikh. He has a mahad, mahad al-lawa al in Islamabad on Milam Road. He's also a professor at the Jamia al-Islamiyya. Sheikh Abid rahman bin Muhammad Bashir. And he has a book called Mu'allam al-Quran. I don't know if you can get it online. Uh, it's an amazing book. I think it's the best book to teach Arabi to people that want to understand the Quran at a beginning level. If you see it, we taught it in San Diego a few times. So I went to him. And I told him, you know, Sheikh told me to come to you and this, I want to study. And he told me, okay. And in one year, I studied al ibn Malik with him. I have to, had to memorize the abiyat at night, read it to him in the morning, and then explain it, and then the next dars every day. One year, he didn't take a penny from me. He didn't take a single penny from me. And imagine, some countries you go, I'm not going to mention names, but the first thing they do is, how much are you going to pay me? And then when you agree to a payment, you tell them, okay, this is how much I'll pay you for Arabi, this, this, this. Then they'll jack up the price on you. <laughs> In the middle of the dars, they'll be like, no, no, I'm going to increase it. Like, Khalas, akhi, I mean, I have nothing against you getting paid for your time and I want you to feed your family, but this is not a business. This is something you do for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And people forget that knowledge is not tied to any country, to any nationality, to any borders. Some of the greatest ulama in our time have been ajam. In our time. I'm not just talking about like Bukhari and this like this. No. Today, if you study Jamia Tirmidhi, the great Jamia Tirmidhi, the great book, what is the standard sharh explanation that you go to? Tawfatul Ahwadi, who wrote it? Al Mubarak Puri. Huh? From India. Tayyib. Sunan Abi Dawood. Aun al-Ma'bud Bi sharh Sunan Abi Dawood Al-Azim Abadi The Shaykh of Al-Mubarak Puri These are standards What is the most popular book of Sira nowadays? Al-Rahiq Mubarak Puri Safir Rahman Mubarak Puri So now you see knowledge and, and these books are deep Knowledge is all over You go to Ethiopia You go to Somalia, you go to uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, you will find great ulama. So don't restrict yourself and think, okay, if I don't get into this one university, khalas, I'm not going to seek knowledge. Not just that, alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed, blessed you brothers here with tulab ilm and shuyukh and ulama that are teaching you here. I mean, this is amazing. Don't lose that opportunity. Don't think, Yalla, instead of him, I'm going to go watch a video. And that video is... No. The Salaf of this Ummah, they used to take that knowledge one-on-one. -on -one. You know, Imam al-Shafi'i, when he went to study with Imam Malik, I don't know if you guys have heard, it's amazing. Right? Imam al-Shafi'i, his cousin was an Amir, like he was a governor. So he had political authority, and he wrote a letter to the Amir of Medina that this is my relative and he wants to study with Imam Malik so make it happen. You know, I'm, I'm kind of summarizing and translating so don't take it uh, verbatim. If you want to know the whole thing, go to uh, Al-Bayhaqi has Manaqib al-Shafi'i. So when Imam al-Shafi'i went, the Amir of Medina, he sees the letter, he says, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raja. If you had asked me to move a mountain, this would have been easier than trying to intercede with Malik. <laughs> That's the, the, yani the, the izzah that Allah had given those ulama. That even though Mara were afraid of them. Where he said, Khalas, now that you have come and you brought this letter, I'll go with you. So they went to the house of Imam Malik and they knocked. And the servant, they came to ask, who is it? They said, we're here to see Malik. They said, if you are here for the dars, go to the masjid. And this is not, there's no special durus here, right? And if you've come for whatever else, I mean, this is not, you're not going to get it here. 
There is no intercession here. You could be the Amir, you could be the king, you could be the prince, whatever. It doesn't make a difference. But Shafi'i, yani he had come with this ikhlas, this niyyah. He persisted. And when Imam Malik saw that Imam Shafi'i had memorized Muatta, he had memorized the entire Muatta, and he already, then he took him as a student. And they became close when he took that knowledge from him. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, how he did the same with a Shafi'i. Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i, rahmatullah alayhi. Imam Ahmad would then study with him. And they had such a close relationship that Imam al-Shafi'i, he would tell Imam Ahmad, you are a'lam minni, you are more knowledgeable than me in hadith. So if you know the sihha, if you know the authenticity of the hadith, correct me. Like look at that humbleness. He is the ustad, he is the teacher. But he had that relationship. And this is the type of humbleness we should see in the ulama and hirs that we should see in the tullab ilm. Imam al-Shafi'i one time, he came to the house of Imam Ahmad. And Imam Ahmad used to praise a shafii a lot to his children. And he would tell them about this great scholar and his zuhud and his knowledge and his abilities. So his children were very excited. And Imam Ahmad is very unique. Most of the ulama, you see their names and then you, you don't really know who their children are. Like their children, you, you may know in Kutub al tarikh but they don't really uh, bring a lot of like knowledge again. Right? You know, this Imam is famous. Like Imam Bukhari is famous. Anybody know his children's names? Yeah. <laughs> Some ulama say he didn't have children. Well, we don't even know, right? But Imam Ahmad, his children are ulama. Abdullah and Saleh, they, 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 they copied the hadith from their father, they learned the fiqh, they, they continued, they were ulama. So when they were young, they were very excited to meet a Shafi'i. A Shafi'i, when he came to the house, they had dinner, then the way they would do for their father, and Imam Ahmad, is they would have a bowl of water and a miswak ready, according to the sunnah. So he would sleep and then he would wake up and he would make wudu and do the siwak and he would pray Qam al-Layl for a long time. Imam Ahmad, he was a zahir. His son Abdullah says that when he was in prison, he used to make 300 nafal rak'at in a day. 300 rak'at. Imagine, in a day, nafal, not including faraid. But this is when he was in prison. So even when he was not, he was a zahid, he used to make a lot of ibadah. When they did the same for the shafi, they put the water, they put the siwak. Imam Shafi'i went, laid down, Till Fajr, he didn't get up. And then he went straight for Fajr Salah without touching the water. So khalas, the, the children of Imam Ahmad were like, Dad, you were talking all this stuff about a Shafi'i. Look, he didn't even make wudu and he went for Fajr. And didn't pray Qiyam al-Layl, didn't touch the siwa. Imam Ahmad would never tolerate anybody to say anything about his teacher. So he went to the Shafi'i, he asked him. He told him, you know, I put my head down and I started thinking about a hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was talking to the brother of Anas ibn Malik and he told him about the bird. Ya Umair, ma fa'alta an Umair. A very light hadith. And he said, I started deriving fawaid for the ummah from this hadith continuously until the Fajr time came. From one small hadith, yani fawaid on fawaid, these were ulama. He said, I didn't even fall asleep. That's why I didn't even refresh my wudu. And these are the imma and ulama who stood for the haq. Imam Ahmad, when the fitna happened, you guys know about the fitna, the mahna. At that time, our ummah was at a stage where it could have all gone astray. Meaning the khalifa, the wali al-amr, the leader, the you could say from Western perspective, the king yeah, had taken an aqidah that was false. He had said the Quran is makhluq, is creation. As a mu'tazila, they pushed this aqidah. And this was forced on everybody. And the ulama divided into three. Those that sold out, those that when the government pressure came, they sold out. And those that left, they made hijrah. They left to other lands. They went to Egypt. They went to different areas. And those that became quiet. 
They didn't sell out. They said what they had to say. They said it but with the intention in their heart that they didn't believe it. There was only two people left in the ummah there in that area that stood on the haqq. Muhammad bin Nuh and Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Imagine. And you hear sometimes, I don't know about the UK, you guys got numbers, mashallah. But in the US sometimes, we feel like a minority, like we feel like we're weak, like we're few. And the, and the enemy, like this Sunday, before I came here, we had the da'wah at Baboa Park. We had six different groups of Christians. Those videos haven't even posted yet. And, and, and you will see on the One Message Foundation, even it got crazy. Like, you know, people were up each other's faces, were pushing and shoving. It was about to come to blows. And we are few and we're surrounded by all these. So sometimes you're like, man, I, you know, we're few. But imagine there's only two and even the Muslim Ummah is against you. And right when the Mahna began, Muhammad ibn Nuh died. So now who's left? One man. Imam Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Why do we call him that? Not because of his fiqh. Not because of his work in hadith. Because of his defense of the aqidah. So here, he's left. They tell him we have the, we will kill you. So, Khalas, no problem. Come shuhada. We'll imprison you. Imam Ahmad, they told him we'll imprison you. He said, no problem. The prison is the same as my house. <laughs> Imagine the prison is the same. This is the zuhud. Yani no furniture in prison, no furniture at home. No comfortable king size, California king, memory foam bed at home. Not in prison. And he said, I'm not scared of the prison. It's just like my house. They told him, we'll whip you. Now again, understand something. When you talk about whipping, today you guys think like, you know, the movies like, like little. La, la. When they used to whip, they would rip skin. They would rip your skin. With the whip, there was one, the man who they chose, they said in 10 whips, he would kill uh, an, an elephant. Something like that. And this was somebody who would hit hard. So they said, we'll whip you. So Imam Ahmed, he said, I didn't mind becoming shaheed. Khalas. I didn't mind being in prison. But I didn't want to be whipped. Like I felt uncomfortable. Man, something is painful. It's degrading. And they put you just in the izar. And they <coughs> he said, then there was a drunk. A gangster, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm translating into current terminology, yeah? and he, uh, a thug, and he, and he was there, and he was whipped for alcohol, for drinking alcohol. And he told Imam Ahmad, you're Ahmad ibn Hanbal? He said, yes. He said, oh Imam, be firm on what you're upon. He said, I have been whipped for drinking alcohol and I still drank. <laughs> so if I can be patient, for ma'asi, for sin, you should be more patient for the haqq. Imam Ahmad said, nobody's words gave me greater con con like console than his. After that, I wasn't scared of the whip. So they brought the mehna, they started the trial. And the mu'tazila, they had the government. So they would, they would, Imam Ahmad would fast in the day and they wouldn't give him food at night. And they tied a chain with a heavy ball, like a heavy metal. So you couldn't carry it even. So imagine you're not eating, you're not sleeping, you're, you're, you're being imprisoned under that stress. And then they would make him sit and they would have a whole panel of the ulema of bid'ah, like those scholars that were of people of bid'ah, and they would debate with him. And they would throw from here, from here, from here, and he would respond. And this is very important. When they would, throw, when they would put an ayah or hadith, he would respond, he would explain it. When they would throw kalam, when they would throw philosophy, he would not respond to them. He would tell them, bring me something from the Quran or the Hadith for me to respond. This is an important principle in da'wah for us. In da'wah, our, our basis, our platform is Quran and Hadith, not philosophy. If you want to come and, and in some of our debates, Christians have come and tried to throw kalam to try to catch us. I didn't go down that path. I told him, no, I don't even believe in Kalam. I believe in the Quran. I believe in Sahih Ahadith. So if you want to know, then discuss on that basis. I'm not going to debate with you in philosophy because that's not our platform. Those aren't our rules. Our rules are Quran and Sunnah and the way of the Salaf al-Ummah. 
So when Imam Ahmad, when they would give the hadith and he would respond and he would give the hadith and the authenticity, they couldn't debate him. Oh, the panel with him under this, they couldn't. What did they do? They didn't say, Khalas, you, you're right, you have the dalil. No, they said, whip him. The people of bid'ah, the people of shirk and others, everybody of dalala, of misguidance, this is their way. When they lose the debate, they want to get violent. We see this with Ibrahim alayhi salam. We see this with the Salaf of the Summa. We see this with the Quraysh yani against the, the Sahaba. We see this repeatedly. They said, whip him. So they tied an izar. And right? they put just the, uh, we call it izar. What do you call it here? I don't know. We, some people call it lungi. Mawis. I was getting to the Somali, I think. <laughs> uh, they tied the mawis. And they started to whip. And when they whipped, and this is not one of those weird stories. You can look this up, Kutub Tariq. I mean, I have people of knowledge here. They can check me if I'm wrong. When they whipped, his izar started to loosen. The izar started to loosen. Now imagine he's being whipped. And you know he was whipped on the face. And his face ripped open. And afterwards, you know how they, how they, 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 they treated it? They didn't have uh, any doctors and things like the way we have. They took metal clamps. They clamped his face, pulled up the skin, cut it and soldered it. Till his death, he had those scars on his face and his back and his body where the whip, the whip would rip the skin. So at that time, he's being whipped. What is he worried about? His aura not exposing. What happened to us as ummah? Today, our youth are walking around showing their aura. You tell them, Akhi, what is this? Is the khilaf on this issue? Today our sisters are walking around with their aura showing, not worried about it. They put a piece of cloth on their head and khalas, that's hijab. Tight jeans, tight shirts, yeah, makeup up, I wear hijab. Allah, mashallah, I don't know what kind of hijab this is. You just didn't want to do your hair today. But Imam Ahmad, you look at him, he's worried about his aura. So he makes dua to Allah, two hands come out of the ground. Tariqh, witness, go look it up in the books. And they protect his izar. Right? No? Huh? You look at these. These are the salaf of this ummah. And at that time, they start to tell him, the, the Mu'tazila, because they get scared now. They tell him, just tell me in my ear that Quran is makhluq and I'll save you from the king. And Imam Ahmad tells them, you tell me in my ear that the Quran is غير makhluq, the kalam of Allah, so I can save you from the punishment of Allah on the day of judgment. These imma and alama, they served this ummah. They went through hardship for this ummah. Imagine on the day of judgment, when we are standing giving our hisab, when Allah takes us to account, what did you do for my deen? And Imam Ahmad is there and Allah asked Imam Ahmad, why were you whipped? He said, for your deen, Ya Allah. Why were you whipped for your deen, Ya Allah? When we are asked that question, what did you do for the deen of Allah? What will we answer? What have we done? What have we sacrificed? What have we... Today, we are afraid to stand firm on the Quran and Sunnah. When you're in school and they bring up evolution, we're afraid to challenge it. No, no, it's okay. Find a way. What's that guy here? Something. Uh, yeah. Never gonna mention his name. Find some way to justify it. We came from monkeys, apes. Maybe they came from monkeys. I'm good. No. Today, when they want to know about hudud in Sharia, we want to say no, 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 no. That was for a long time ago. Norway. What is that? Norways. What did somebody say? Somebody said if. If the Sahaba went to Norway, they would be impressed by them. Na'udhu Billah. Countries with LGBTQXYZ and, and people marrying monkeys and dogs and things. You think we'd be impressed by this? The Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is justice. This is, this is the best. It's divine. 
is better than democracy, it's better than communism, it's better than socialism, it's better than this ism, it's better than that ism. There is nothing that can be compared to the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we will stand on this. And we will give our lives on this. And if somebody wants to arrest us, khalas, let's go. If somebody wants to do whatever, exile, let's go. What are you, what are you going to do? It's okay. We'll go check out some other countries. Eh? Vacation. So, we as Muslims have to stand firm on the Qur'an and the Sunnah. We have to stand firm on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. And we have to take that knowledge and implement it. We have to take that knowledge and teach it and share it. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those that seek beneficial knowledge, wherever we may find it. And we make, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those that take that knowledge and then share it. Whatever we know, you go to school, you go to uni, as you guys call it, uni. You go to uni, talk to people about Islam. Ramadan, Eid al Adha, these are opportunities. Bring it up. Don't be shy. If they have questions, we got answers. Look, the problems humanity is facing today, the disease of homosexuality, the disease of riba. The disease of interest-based loans, the disease of family structures falling apart, the disease of feminism, the disease of red pillism, the disease of blue... I don't, I don't, I don't, is that such a thing? No, I don't think that's a thing. Sorry. Yeah. All these diseases, we have the solutions. What is the solution? The Quran was Sunnah. Ala manhaj salaf al ummah. The Quran and the Sunnah upon the way of the early generations of this ummah the great imma like abu hanifa and malik and shafi and ahmad and awza'i and those great abdullah ibn mubarak and nakha'i and sufyan and thawri and all these great imma and ulama this is their way and we hope that allah makes us for those that are firm on this way